Um, so this is the penultimate uh, session of the meeting, and it is my pleasure to invite our final uh, invited speaker, Dr. Thomas Terrell, who comes to us from Clinton, Tennessee, where he's a member of the Covenant Medical Group. Dr. Terrell has a Master of Philosophy degree in Biological Anthropology from Cambridge. He has an MD from Emory University. He's a former Division I basketball player who has extensive experience in a variety of sports medicine settings, including work with athletes at the professional, collegiate, and high school levels. And I think you'll find his presentation today to be particularly timely. And the, the title of his talk is The Role of Genetic Factors in Concussion Risk and Post-Concussion Recovery in Athletes. Dr. Terrell. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to, for the kind uh, opportunity to speak. And I want to thank CERN and Surge for this great opportunity. I, I never thought I would ever be speaking at a genetics meeting. I'm, <laughs> I'm holding on tight because I'm intimidated by all these brainy geneticists out there. But I know uh, you guys are dedicated to your craft and you you're making a difference in the clinical world and uh, lives of uh, families and people. Uh, I uh, uh, have spent much of my career in primary care sports medicine, which is uh, a field that's about 35 years uh, old. And uh, I did my family medicine training here in Asheville Mission Hospital, and then I did a, a fellowship in sports medicine. So I spent about 15, 18 years working with Division I uh, college athletic programs, taking care of uh, college football, uh, soccer, uh, lacrosse, uh, you know, gymnastics, all sorts of athletes. And I developed this interest in concussion uh, in my fellowship, but there was such a paucity of data and uh, uh, information. The lectures were, you know, it was about an hour and, and you had to hard, work hard to fill in the time. I feel like we could spend the next three days talking about concussions. So I did my best to, to focus the, the, the presentation. Uh, uh, this is a, a timely issue. I think, uh, I know since uh, Ruth Abramson, uh, and I talked back in 1999 about this at the University of South Carolina. Uh, the explosion of information has been phenomenal. The uh, uh, surge, I'm sorry, the increase in activity, I wanted to do a surge pun there. But uh, so anyway, I used to work uh, with uh, old Coach Lou Holtz and the South Carolina Gamecocks. And I was uh, in academics for 14 years, uh, had three or four academic positions in family medicine. And uh, with a four and a half year old daughter, uh, recently married, uh, I decided I would uh, uh, try some uh, private practice for a few years, but I'm hoping to get back into academics soon. So without, without further ado, there's Troy Aitman. He, he's uh, a little dated now, but some of you remember he had a bunch of concussions and he played a game and didn't even know the plays uh, when he was just running them on muscle memory. And here's an unfortunate hockey injury. Uh, head first under the boards doesn't really work too well usually. Uh, my outline is we're gonna define the concussion problem a little bit. Uh, how many of you are, are clinicians or uh, genetic counselors? Uh, okay. And how, how many of you are those hardcore bench research types? Oh, yeah. Very impressive. No, seriously, I, I'll, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing. And uh, so we're going to talk about some background literature. We're going to talk about previous literature on sports concussion and genetic risk factors. And then we're going to discuss uh, briefly the cross-sectional study that, that, that uh, Ruth and I uh, uh, performed at University of South Carolina. And then we're going to get into the, the work that was a long period of uh, effort, prospective cohort study, the largest one that's been in the literature to our knowledge. 
And then we're going to touch on genotypes associated with post-concussion recovery. There's not a whole lot of literature out there, but we'll discuss it and then future directions and con conclusions. So here's a video of a, a nice little injury. Javid Best was a star running back for University of California. And watch him. He's coming around the left end here. Here he goes, head first, helmet off. He's posturing. See his arms out? That's actually boom. So uh, he was actually OK. I mean, he, he sat out a few weeks. But this is the kind of trauma uh, that can really be really tough. And of course, he was, he was knocked unconscious, so they mobilized his, his, his C-spine and spine boarded him to be for precautions. And uh, he had a concussion in, uh, uh, do I just advance? OK. He had a concussion in, in the, for the Detroit Lions, and that ended his pro career. He never played again. Uh, so uh, there are high profile concussions like that, but they're happening all over the high school athletic uh, fields, the middle school fields. They happen in emergency rooms. Things fall off, hit people in the head, unfortunate car wrecks. Uh, so it's a, it's a prevalent problem. Uh, you think of great coaches in history, and you think of Pat Summit from University of Tennessee, uh, great women's basketball coach, and you think of Vince Lombardi. Some people think he's the greatest coach ever, the Green Bay Packers. And then there's Muffet McGraw from Notre Dame women's basketball. They've won a, a few national titles. And then I say, would you like to work with this guy, Brian Kelly, head coach at Notre Dame? He looks real warm and fuzzy and supportive, doesn't he? Who would you pick? Would you work with this this coach or this coach? I work. I prefer working with this coach, Dr. Ruth Abramson. Thank you for your mentorship, Ruth. Very nice photo, Ruth. Okay. So thanks again, Ruth, for your scholarly contributions of project mentorship and friendship, and great coaching, of course. And then I want to thank my other co-investigators, Dr. Bennett, Cantu, Laskowitz, Bostic, and Dr. G, Ellen Bennett from Duke, who did all the genetics, and funding from Noxy, AMSSM, and, and PMRF. So 3.8 million sports concussions happen annually in the US. How do we define concussion? It's a traumatically induced uh, brain injury induced by biomechanical forces, results in the rapid onset of short-lived impairment of neurological function, and it resolves spontaneously. And this is from the 2001 Consensus Conference of Concussion. Uh, there's significant risk associated with concussions, including uh, three and a half time increased risk of future concussion, post-concussion syndrome, and then there's catastrophic in, in, in injury, such as second impact syndrome. Uh, and then the chronic traumatic encephalopathy as well. Uh, one of the key things that led us to look at this as a possibility as a research subject was a genetic variation may affect TBI risk and clinical outcome following a traumatic brain injury, uh, that being severe TBI or concussion. And this has been shown in multiple studies. So there's a lot of variability in concussion. There's a variability in the risk that uh, individuals have uh, going into activity. And that's affected by a number of uh, intrinsic and extrinsic issues. Uh, previous concussion certainly being one of those. And we think genetic uh, factors may influence that. In addition, there's variability in outcome. So what influences this? Could genetic polymorphisms influence it. So our research questions uh, when we started this project were our genetic polymorphisms such as APOE4, the APOE uh, G-219 promoter. I'm just going to call it the APOE promoter for simplicity sake here. Uh, interleukin 6R, interleukin 6, and then there's two tau polymorphisms, the serine 53 pro and histidine 47 tyrosine. These are two of the only ones described in, the, in 2000, 2001. Uh, 
So we're looking at, are these polymorphisms associated with a risk of sports concussion? And uh, are they associated with neurocognitive recovery after concussion? Of course, there's lots of other uh, interesting things like severity, but we don't have time to get into that today. So previous literature, uh, when we started uh, this process was really sparse, but in uh, 2010, Turney did a study uh, with about 300 subjects and it was a retrospective study, and they found no association between APOE uh, or the APOE promoter and concussion risk. Um, their main finding was they only had four concussions, and three of the four people with concussions had the, either the E4 allele plus the TT genotype of the APOE promoter. So that was a very small sample. Then Dr. Chrisman, did a prospective study with 318 concussions, and again, they found no significant association. They were limited to a sample of only 28 concussions. Uh, so our study, we looked at 195 college football and women's and men's soccer players at uh, four uh, university settings, and uh, we obtained a self-reported concussion history. This was a cross-sectional study. This was our pilot study. And we studied the, uh, excuse me, we studied the polymorphisms I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. And, uh, right. Well, th this is a, this, this is the cross-sectional, this was sort of the pilot. The perspective did have 1,095, uh, uh, concuss uh, 1,095 subjects. So you're exactly right, Dr. Abramson. So, uh, so this is what speared us on, really. So we found a self-reported concussed athlete was 2.7 times as likely to have this genotype, the promoter, and it's the G minus 219T. That's the only APOE promoter of the three described that have uh, had an association with TBI that I know of. And so the TT genotype, that increased your risk 2.7 times compared with the GG or GT. And our confidence intervals are pretty narrow, 1.1 to 6.8, and our p-value is 0.03. We didn't find any associations between self-reported concussion and tau protein or the uh, APOE uh, uh, gene. And this was 2008. And this just shows uh, the data. Uh, 2.7 is the odds ratio for TT. And then 1.0 is the referent value, the odds ratio for GG. So you can see there's a significant increase there. Now we know that there's limitations in that uh, cross-sectional format and the self-reported uh, history. So in 2004, uh, Ben and Amalu uh, presented, and I was at a meeting, he presented this information about uh, Mike Webster is having uh, abnormal findings on his autopsy, and he called it chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also known as CTE. <coughs> Webster was an all-pro who, in his mid-40s, ended up homeless and unfortunately depressed uh, and uh, committed suicide. And so it really uh, struck a chord for obvious reasons. What a tragedy. Uh, and so, uh, this autopsy, uh, necropsy, showed these findings, and then as he continued to look in, into this, he found hyperphosphorylation of tau protein uh, in, in various regions, and this is well described by Dr. McKee, in the cerebral sulci. And you can see in the normal brain here, there's really not any tau, uh, phosphorylated tau deposition, but you can see these little clumps of it. And there's all sorts of stuff you can find on the, in the literature. So this has been described as early as age 17 now. Uh, and a recent study showed about 99% of NFL players with necropsy brain studies had uh, CTE findings. So of course there's this movie uh, with Will Smith. Uh, and you know, so that it's, I don't want to be melancholic, but there's been this sort of haze over the whole issue. Is, when CTE hit the, hit the uh, press and hit, hit us in the medical community, it was very, uh, it was very uh, concerning. And so there's a lot of questions about, well, is CTE caused by concussion? So the, 
issue of concussions, right, you know, became even more concerning. And, uh, and then is CTE uh, affected by genetic factors? Is there a genetic predisposition to it? And so, although it's a little off the topic, it, uh, I think it just points out that how important, you know, s this area is for research in general. And so far, CTE has been uh, described uh, uh, mainly in collision athletes, and they, and they feel it's due to repetitive subconcussive forces, not uh, concussions uh, themselves. So that was recently uh, uh, reported in a, in a paper this year in Brain, the uh, journal Brain. So, uh, so with that, with that being said, I, th I felt like I needed to mention CTE. Uh, so genetic factors, they can play a role in susceptibility to concussion, severity, and timing of post-concussion recovery. Of course, there's other factors, ADD history, learning disability, and prior concussion. Uh, and then um, previous literature, uh, this is just a little justification for why we picked these polymorphisms. APOE4 uh, was shown to increase the risk of poor TBI outcome in a number of studies in the early 2000s. And then uh, APOE G minus 219T is a polymorphism in the coding region of the APOE gene. It's been described more in uh, Alzheimer's, really. And then tau protein is important in microtubule stability. So with tau deposition in neurofibrillary tangles and neuritic plaques of Alzheimer's disease, we just uh, selected this gene based on the literature and, and, and looked at it. Now, interleukin-6 has uh, more uh, recently been added to our study, and it's a pleiotrophic cytokine, and it can be pro-inflammatory, and it can be anti-inflammatory. Uh, concussion is a neuroinflammatory process, and so inflammation is a big part of the post-concussive biochemical cascade. So interleukin-6 plays a, a key role in that. Uh, and it's also a key uh, player in other inflammatory disorders. Uh, so in the human brain, the, uh, the SIL6R, uh, it's the uh, receptor, uh, the soluble receptor. Uh, there's a membrane bound and then there's one that's free floating. And it basically, the literature showed that the SIL6R upregulates endogenous production of IL-6. Uh, and that's, as we said, a major cytokine. So we felt this interleukin-6R uh, polymorphism uh, might have some merit too. So uh, IL-6 has shown various studies that show it can increase uh, risk of, uh, well, it's associated with uh, concussions at, at uh, let's see, day five and then six months, the levels of IL-6 are increased. So we know it, it, it can play a role. So this is a prospective cohort study that we uh, performed, and it did have about close to 1,095, 1,056 genotyped ap appetite. Uh, my appetite, I'm hungry, I guess. Freudian slip, uh, genotyped athletes. And we looked at 23 universities across the, the country. And in that cohort, we had 133 concussed and 923 non-concussed. Our overall study cohort was over 3,500 people, which is the largest in the literature. However, we just weren't able to genotype all those people for funding purposes. We also obtained baseline uh, gen uh, medical and concussion history uh, and neuropsychological testing, as well as post-concussion uh, testing of, on a number of parameters that I, I won't really mention. So we had a large uh, prospective study. We could follow them longitudinally. We had people in the field to verify concussion, and then we could obtain appropriate history after the injury. And uh, a, ver a variety of genetic uh, sampling methods were, were used to obtain the specimens, and time doesn't allow me to to discuss that, and I'd refer you to our article uh, in our methods section in the British Journal of Sport Medicine. Um, but uh, uh, so these are the same polymorphisms, and I put the RS numbers in, 
this time. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know it's a big deal. Uh, so what did our statistics show? Well, we did a chi-square, and we found we had a significant difference between the concussed group and the non-concussed group uh, in several uh, variables, including uh, gender, uh, uh, main sport, whether you played football. Football athletes are more likely to have concussion than soccer or softball or other athletes. The, the vast majority, 90%, were soccer and football uh, players. The number of years playing the main sport was also associated. The longer you play, the more likely you're to have a concussion in the prospective study. And then a history of self-reported concussion that uh, is in keeping with prior literature, showing that there is an increased risk if you have self uh, prior concussion. And then concussion with loss of consciousness. So this was the, the, the most interesting part, was we looked at uh, the association of, of various genotypes was sustaining a new concussion during that prospective study. So we've moved forward from the self-reported history we used in the cross-sectional study. Now we have the, the, the d desirable uh, study methodology. And we found, um, so on the left is a genetic polymorphism. We've got interleukin 6R and, we, and these both are from interleukin 6R. We have the genotypes uh, and then we have the percentage of individuals with concussion during the study. And then uh, we have self-reported prior concussion. And we have our p-values. So what did we find? Well, if you had the uh, interleukin-6, uh, let's just go here, CC genotype, 51.8% of the concussions, uh, concussed individuals had this genotype. Uh, as opposed to the AA or the AC genotype, there's only 23%. So the p-value is very, very statistically significant, 0 0.0001. And then it bears out in self-reported concussions. The p-value is also very high for that. If you had the uh, CC uh, plus the AC genotype, that was 32.6% yeah, would be combined in that group and only 20.5% uh, uh, had the AA genotype, and this was significant of 0.02. So there might be a gene dosing effect uh, or allele uh, effect with the, the C allele there. So uh, then we looked at APOE, and this was very interesting. It was very difficult to explain this, but I think we did a pretty good job. APOE4, as you know, has been associated with an increased risk of poor outcome after a TBI. So we found that it, it reduced your risk uh, of concussion during the prospective study. 8.7% uh, had the APOE4 allele, whereas 13.7% of the concussions were E2 or E3. So uh, the total uh, p-value was significant uh, at 0.03. Uh, we didn't really reach statistically significant uh, for the uh, promoter polymorphism, although uh, uh, we did trend that in the right direction. So the summary is APOE4 was associated with reduced risk of concussion, and as, as I said in prior studies, uh, E4 has been uh, associated with uh, mainly poor post concussion outcome, there haven't been a lot of studies looking at risk of concussion based on the polymorphisms, but uh, many of the studies show that there is no effect of APOE4. It's sort of a mixed bag. Uh, so we recommend a you know, larger study to, to try to tease that out further. Uh, there may be a role of uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA in some of the polymorphisms of mitochondrial DNA, uh, and that may explain our finding here. Uh, so, um, we did multiple regression analysis and we did unadjusted associations looking at concussion uh, as the main predictor var variable and then we did uh, some adjusted associations. So we would look at the relationship of concussion with polymorphism but we factored out the effects of, of gender, number of years playing sport 
and another factor. Uh, so our unadjusted regression, and I decided just to show this in text. It was very hard to, to uh, project this, this, uh, this data. So if you had the IL-6R CC genotype, you had a significant association with concussion, and our odds ratio was 3.48. Our confidence intervals were, were pretty narrow uh, because of our sample size, and our p-value was 0 0.002. So this is the first reported association of interleukin 6R, uh, any of the genotypes, uh, with uh, uh, concussion at any level. But this is uh, the largest study of, of college athletes that we know that's been presented. So uh, we were really pleased that, that, that we were able to find uh, this relationship. And then, like I said, uh, APOE4 uh, was also associated with concussion, but it was, more, uh, uh, interestingly, a little, a more protective. The odds ratio is 0 0.61, so 39% uh, reduced risk of concussion if you had E4. And that was difficult to explain, but... Uh, so what, what about the adjusted uh, association? So we did the same... Uh, analysis, sorry, looking at IL-6R CC genotype and was it associated with concussion, but we, we removed the confounding effects of, uh, uh, sorry, gender, number of years playing sport, uh, and they did not meaningfully alter the, the, the uh, odds ratios, the uh, uh, data was held with a statistically significant finding. And uh, so we were able to remove the, the confounding effects of, of just being in, in a risk position, playing sport for a longer period of time with increased exposure. So I thought that was important. So we had quite a, a few weaknesses. We were underpowered uh, to look at some of the polymorphisms. And there's underreporting of concussion by many subjects, and that's a uniform problem. And then we had lack of control for exposure to potential injury. So we didn't really uh, con control for the fact that some individuals may have, have, have played their sport for one year, or in another, uh, another group or another individual might have been uh, on the college soccer team for three years. So to do that properly, you have to do a Cox proportional hazard analysis, and we're hoping to finish that in the next year, and that should be helpful. So that is a, a limitation of the study. Uh, so um, again, uh, I think I'm, I'm running low on time probably. How much time do I have? I have 30 minutes left. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> All right, so uh, that's good. We can we can do questions. That's what we want to do. So uh, so how do we explain these results? And again, I'm I'm not a geneticist, uh, uh, no, but Ruth and, and Dr. Bennett and, and uh, several of us, mainly Dr. Bennett and Ruth Abramson, uh, were able to uh, call the literature, and and uh, we we found that potentially an increase in the S interleukin 6R levels, uh, uh, the interleukin 6R receptor uh, may have led to increased severity uh, of the inflammatory response uh, at the, the moment of, of uh, concussive force. And uh, that could have led to a reduction in cognition and you present with symptoms and manifest with a full-fledged you know, concussion. So um, interleukin-6 uh, is probably involved with that. So how, do, how do, does this study uh, Im impact clinical practice in the future? Uh, I work with a lot of uh, uh, sports medicine physicians, and, and lots of people are looking for a quick, you know, a point of care blood test. I don't know what it is. Uh, people just want a sideline test to diagnose concussion. And I think you should, it'd be great if we had that, but I think you, you do a good clinical history and a good exam. And 
Now, that's the gold standard at this point. So uh, that's one of the, the points uh, I was trying to make in, in, the, in the paper is that this is such a complex, and, and you, with your expertise, you can speak to this better than I can, but there, there, there's no one genetic polymorphism or two or three that's going to explain the variability in concussion risk or concussion outcome. And uh, so that's what makes, uh, you know, a point of care blood test pretty, pretty tricky. Um, so genotype, genotype, and then haplotype genotype, as well as gene environmental interactions act in a complex faction to affect concussion risk. So it's not just uh, the APOE4 gene, uh, the APOE4 allele, I'm sorry, uh, that is going to be the holy grail. And I think a lot of uh, people uh, who, who aren't as knowledgeable about genetics have, have worked hard, and I'm not trying to denigrate anybody, but uh, this is just extremely complex. And, uh, and I think that it's going to take time to really tease out what, what all the factors are and what the polymorphisms are. But I think we made a good start. Uh, so a single poly, uh, complex polygenic relationship and not a single polymorphism may explain concussion risk and recovery. So, uh, so in conclusion, in this first section, IL-6R may increase risk of concussion in college athletes, whereas APOE4 show the reduced risk of concussion. Uh, obviously, further research is needed with larger studies, and uh, genetic testing remains uh, a research tool and not a clinical uh, uh, tool for assessing concussion risk, concussion recovery, uh, et cetera. Uh, there are uh, some research labs that are, that are uh, using it and uh, appropriately, but I think Many uh, uh, individuals want to uh, be able to uh, come up with a blood test to just you know, diagnose the problem or predict the risk, and I, I think we're a ways off from that. Um, so the last part of the talk was on uh, what about post-concussion neurocognitive deficits in genotype? Okay, so you have a a concussion, you have some neurocognitive deficits that occur, mainly in uh, speed of information processing, attention span, reaction time. There's other measures. Uh, there's a whole host of neuropsychological tests that have been described. There's paper and pencil tests, and then there's these computerized neuropsychological testing platforms. We, we use one of those platforms called Headminder as well as a program called IMPACT to do baseline testing. So uh, this, this uh, picture is on the, in the New York Times. The New York Times really does a lot of uh, writing about concussions. Um, so what did the research show about uh, polymorphisms affecting uh, concussion recovery? You know, how do we predict who's going to recover more quickly? Who is going to take 21 days to recover? Who are we going to talk, who are we going to have to hold out longer, uh, have discussions with the family? Is there any way to sort of predict recovery? Uh, so a couple of studies have been done. Dr. Tom McAllister, who's now at Dartmouth, uh, looked at brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and uh, he found that it influenced memory and processing speed at one month uh, after brain injury. So this, this uh, uh, BTNF is involved in repair and plasticity. So uh, that was a 2012 study. And then he also looked at uh, I mean, a dopamine D2 receptor allele. Um, dopamine uh, is involved in uh, risk-taking behavior and uh, so he, he's a psychiatrist, so I think dopamine's D2 receptors also have been involved, uh, been associated with uh, psychiatric illness like schizophrenia and other issues. So he found that the T allele was associated with uh, 
decreased measures of response latency. So just uh, they, they had a slower uh, reaction time, essentially, uh, on this verbal learning test. So, uh, and then as I said at the beginning of this, this uh, section of the talk, uh, neurocognitive deficits are associated with acute sports concussion. And my colleague and co-investigator, Dr. Jeff Barth from UVA, showed that in one of the first studies uh, uh, done in Ivy League uh, uh, football players. Uh, that following a concussion, you, you have a neurocognitive deficit of some time, uh, some type, I mean. That seems pretty uh, obvious now, but uh, that was a big deal uh, at, that, at that time. So our study methodology, what did we do? Well, we, we discussed our um, prospective cohort study and our 1,056 subjects. We did our baseline uh, questionnaire, genetic testing. But we also um, uh, obtained baseline neuropsychological testing on all the participants. Uh, and uh, we probably had about 1,800 people do it. Uh, and we then obtained post-concussion testing after the concussion at 24 to 72 hours, at five days, and at seven days. So we want to look at the difference between baseline and post-concussion. Uh, and uh, so what did we find? We, uh, we, our sample was 133 concussed athletes. This was a different sample than what I've, I described in the prospective study, I apologize. So it's, we had uh, a few, of, uh, just a smaller number, 133 concussed athletes. And uh, to pool the data, the, the statistician used factor analysis. So we had these two different software programs and we found that uh, the two main factors that were in common were reaction time and errors, uh, the error, number of errors you commit in the test. So we used those and looked at the difference between baseline and post-concussion testing uh, for errors and reaction time. And uh, looking at the, uh, the polymorphisms, in this instance, the APOE promoter, the TT genotype, uh, was significantly associated with reaction time differences. The sample size was pretty small at 28. Um, uh, there were no associations with APOE and the tau polymorphisms. We didn't look at interleukin in this. So the weaknesses are pretty obvious. The study is very underpowered. We have some new data that we're hoping to publish in the next, uh, next year, hopefully, uh, it, it expands on this with a larger sample. So um, this is one of the, there's probably a handful, maybe five to seven studies that have looked at this particular uh, question. So uh, future directions. There's still no support for genetic testing for concussion risk assessment. Uh, and we need uh, larger sample size to look at neurocognitive recovery. And is there a genetic influence to that? There are a number of studies, including uh, an NCAA DOD study uh, that's ongoing that it got 30 million bucks to look at uh, these very issues we're talking about. And they're using a uh, candidate gene and a little pathway uh, approach and uh, a separate study and a genine-wide association study is, is underway as well. So there is uh, there's some future work uh, on the horizon now there's my contact information, and that's our, our, uh, one of the references. I can get you a full list of references if you just email me or approach me. So thank you for the opportunity to speak, and uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. So I just wondered, do you think that that it's the that the genotype that, that, that people have a certain genotype that puts them at risk for concussions, or is it actually the 
that a concussion or hit that more susceptible to the negative effects of a hit? Is it the person that's the problem, or is it the ability to withstand the concussion that's the problem? Well, it's, it's probably both, but I think the latter is, is more likely. Uh, uh, there, there may be some you know, predisposition uh, to risk-taking behavior. Yeah. Uh, some people may play more aggressively, may do uh, more risk-averse kind of activities playing the sport. But uh, it's, it's probably uh, the response uh, to the same uh, and so force, that, how the, the, the body and the brain responds to the same force of Newton's that uh, might separate one person from another. One genotype may lead to a different inflammatory response after concussion. Because you can put two people together and they, one, one can hit at 130 Newtons head first in another player at UNC Chapel Hill and walk off the field with no symptoms. Yeah, so you don't have a candidate gene, I saw the data, but you don't have a candidate gene that would suggest one or the other yet. Complex. Sorry? Complex. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think so. I think no. this is a, you know, the, okay. this is a, uh, I mean. Um, the hope is you'll find at one point some candidate gene. <laughs> well, I, uh, I think the, the real challenge with uh, college athletics is, uh, you know, there's a lot of other factors involved. That they, they, they have a lot of uh, uh, priorities that don't necessarily line up with, with research. So to get in the trenches and to collect 3,500 genetic specimens from college athletes over 10 years at 23 schools took a lot of, a lot of effort to get this uh, this cohort. Uh, in fact, the largest study was 300 something people. So, uh, no, I don't think we found the holy grail. And that's what I was just trying to point out earlier. I was saying other individuals are doing this work. The NCAA DOD study, they have $30 million to do what we did in about $250,000. So they have. Uh, a large uh, cohort and uh, maybe they can find a little bit more but I think you're right I think it's it's going to be challenging you know and and it's it's just fascinating to me because part of this a human being is a moving target both in terms of development and change over age and so studying younger athletes prior to synap presynaptic pruning during um, teenage years up to, let's say, early 20s um, may give you, given the same risk factors, may give you a different answer. And if you have a concussion in your 30s and 40s, you may have less, um, you'll have ability to change, but it may be less. And then when you get older, the risk factors associated with concussion and um, and um, inflammatory processes, et cetera. There's, we're, we are moving targets in terms of our development over age. Um, and w one of the studies that I think wasn't done with chronic traumatic encephalopathy was we looked at people who were really, really hurt we didn't look at those folks who went on to play football, who went on to play basketball, who played hockey, and didn't have those issues. And so it goes back to the, the baseline of both environmental and genetics. And I think age also plays a role in that. So could I ask quickly, has anybody looked at in a model if, if this is thought to be an inflammatory process of pre-treating an animal model or something with an anti-inflammatory before the injury? Uh, Dr. Laskowitz uh, uh, created a, a small uh, uh, protein uh, model of apoviper protein and injected it. Uh, in an animal model and then uh, looked at the inflammatory response and he found that there was some improvement in a rat model uh, with this 
uh, apolipoprotein. He, uh, his apolipoprotein is important in repair and recovery of damaged neurites. And uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on the basic science, but there was a, a study by Goldstein, and you ought, you ought to look this up. Uh, it's in Brain 2018. And uh, you can just type it in. Uh, they reported on CNN. They looked at uh, uh, an animal model and uh, it caused a, 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 a concussion, essentially. And they were able to demonstrate uh, some degree of tau protein deposition in the living animal and, and with some imaging findings, too. So you might, you might look at that. That's a very good question, though. Just one last question. What do you say? Sorry. Sorry. Hi. Thanks for your talk. Um, so I just wanted to see if you had any additional comments about kind of the ripple effects of your study and this information. Um, specifically, um, this is your like your results um, actually kind of form the basis of how like direct to consumer tests um, you know these polymorphisms um, this this data is actually what is used to create kind of these markers that are used on direct to consumer testing and I know um, because my husband is a consultant for one of these companies that this is exactly what they do is look for these studies find the genotype what's the association um, but I'm just you know worried because I'm a genetic counselor you know, what the ripple effects of this, of people using this information as a direct-to-consumer marker, and then it ends up in my office well, <laughs> having been, to explain that. So. That's a very good point. I've been very cautious and uh, about this for over a decade, and uh, uh, when APOE4, just the APOE4 data, people are, they really want to run with something, and they want to test the high school athletes for APOE4, and I think uh, even this this study needs to be reproduced. I mean, I, I, I don't uh, personally have any kind of relationship with a company that's doing that. I, I know they're out there. I know Banyan Biomarkers is one of them. Uh, I have friends that uh, interact with basic scientists that do that. But I'm, I'm completely against that. I think I was hoping I... I uh, I made that uh, clear in, in my comments that I, I, I think we're a long way away before we can do any genetic testing and look for risk. To, to, to really seriously have a really good study that's validated, a marker or markers that are validated, it really will give us useful information. Because otherwise, I think you're just creating more harm. Uh, and you're, there's, a, there's a real uncomfortable, and no offense, but you know, there's a sort of a commercial component to this that's sort of an undercurrent and I don't know where all that comes from American capitalism or something but even the neuropsychological testing uh, companies like impact they market this to all these schools and there's they're doing lots and lots of tests and there really wasn't a lot of data when they first started uh, their their software but now they have good studies but I, I agree I think there's a the public is clamoring for something and and I've been saying wait 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 but you know, uh, I think other people are gonna have to work through this and I, I I really appreciate your question I think it's a very point on question I had a couple of questions if that's okay um, one is it possible that I, I was wondering about what were the the requirements for the self-reported um, concussive event and whether it's possible that the number of self-reported concussive events is, is perhaps an artifact of increased sensitivity to something like post-concussive um, um, symptoms rather than an actual raw number of, of concussive events. Um, and you also mentioned mitochondrial DNA. Um, and I know that uh, free-floating mitochondrial DNA can actually stimulate IL-6 production. Um, and, and circulating mitochondrial DNA has been reported in, in porcine models of traumatic brain injury. And I was just wondering if you'd, if you'd assayed for free-floating mitochondrial DNA in blood because it's, it's it's pretty, pretty simple, straightforward to do. Dr. Abramson, very thank you for those questions. Dr. Abramson has been keen to do the mitochondrial DNA work. We're yeah. hoping we can do that. Uh, we're doing and then try to get a blood sample from an athlete oh. who is a man, who is a man, excuse me. 
It is, I mean, having done blood studies for years, the most problems that we run into are getting blood studies from males. I, I, uh, uh, African Americans are, are particularly hate blood testing. I, when we did uh, work at uh, a historically black college in Columbia, I, ha I demonstrated how to, how to go through phlebotomy before each data collection session. I had six blood draws on one day. We had about a 40% uh, phlebotomy participation rate. So uh, I think we, we, we asked people if they've ever sustained a concussion. We had a very uh, broad definition. We used any previous blow to the head or episode where you were uh, had headache, lightheadedness, dizziness. You may have never told an athletic trainer or a, a physician. So we, we tried to, to, to use a, a broad uh, definition, but I, I, I think you're right. I mean, self-report is a tough deal. That's a very, a very uh, interesting way you, you, uh, you talked about it's, it. It's just so counterintuitive to think of a genetic predisposition to an external event in your life seems sort of, you know, so it's fascinating that you found it. Well, I mean, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of factors involved and you know, how you respond to the blow to the head. You, you look at Dr. Guskowitz's studies. He, uh, he's found people who have 150 Newton forces to the head have no concussion walk off the field. People who get hit with 40 or 50 have a concussion. There's just this variability that's hard to explain. But you're right, it's, we've got a long way to go. How about over here? Um, how can any of this be used from a management perspective? So like if you learn a little bit about the biology of this, how can then that potentially be used to sort of improve once they actually get a concussion, maybe to be able to improve their ability to recover from it? And I think the stuff with the BDNF that you showed is pretty, pretty interesting because there's a lot of, I think, research out there about epigenetic stuff related to BDNF um, and that, you know, is it possible you could maybe do some dietary changes or other things that could potentially do some epigenetic modification that maybe could actually then improve from a management perspective or improve kind of their ability to recover from these sort of afterwards? Well, I, th I think uh, the dietary stuff is, is, is just starting and there's no proof that it works, but it's certainly uh, worth looking into. And uh, we, we just want to provide some help for clinicians who, who, who are talking to families about uh, return to play, potential retirement, uh, you know, should they quit the sport and play another sport? Uh, who, can we predict who might have a current concussion uh, in a year? If they've had three concussions, is that, you know, should they quit that sport? You know, is there, so, you know, there's some, there's some potential for it, but I think we've got, it's got work to do. I was wondering if you could touch on how APOE4 is um, high risk for Alzheimer's, but it's supposed to be protective here. That's a good point. Yes, APOE4 is a considered a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, most of the studies show that APOE4 is associated with a poor uh, poor outcome after TBI. Uh, the problem with the, 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 the data is that it's uh, heterogeneous, there's severe TBI, there's moderate TBI, there's mild TBI, there's different uh, racial uh, distributions. Uh, it's just a hodgepodge of data. So some studies show there's actually no association at all between APOE4 and outcome. Uh, uh, some a few studies have shown it, it improves outcome, but uh, I think we thought uh, Dr. Abramson may help uh, with this. Um, uh, mitochondrial DNA may may be uh, playing a role here behind the scenes, and it, it, APOE4 may not be protective. It may be uh, something uh, a haplotype. Uh, polymorphism associated uh, interacting with E4. And yeah, the, um, there, there are some old studies and there's been plus and minus, but the organ that uses the most energy is what? The brain. 
And so there are people who have APOE4 who do not develop um, cognitive difficulties until very late if they're going to develop it. And there's been some um, research, plus and minus, but um, it's still very interesting that those folks who have particular mitochondrial clades are the ones who have protection in terms of age of onset of problems. And so it may have something to do with energy metabolism in the brain. And remember, this is a, a complex, it's not just APOE4, and we don't, we, we live in a, a sea of genes, and some of them interact together, and, and we're not smart enough yet. You've got a lot of time ahead of you to do work. <laughs> Thanks. Very interesting discussion. If you have any more.